Well, great to have Travis and Jess and their family back from Taiwan. Yeah. Let's He's coming up to read the scripture for us. Great to have you back, brother. I'll give you the mic. <laughs> so good to see everyone again. Uh, what a blessing to be back in this church. Uh, for those of you who don't know, myself and my wife, uh, we have uh, four kids downstairs, and uh, we've been in Asia for the last seven or eight months or so, and uh, our heart was definitely with Urban Grace the entire time. It's, uh, it was such a blessing to see the way that God is advancing throughout Asia and uh, how he's taking cultures that uh, where people are taught to worship their ancestors or um, to uh, uh, be a good citizen, and, and, and that's where your righteousness comes from, uh, or to follow Buddhist principles. And through the, the boldness and faithfulness of believers there, they are hearing the truth, and the truth is setting them free. And Jesus is on the move uh, throughout Asia, but it was such a blessing whenever we could to check in and just see how God is also moving through Urban Grace as well, and how God is bringing new people into the church. Uh, it's awesome to be able to see new faces, and I'm excited to meet everyone, and I know my wife is the same as well. And uh, it's what a, what a blessing to serve a God that loves us, that pursues us. When we sin, he does not turn his back on us. And uh, I think that this, this scripture that uh, we'll read through today uh, is a great example of, in a world full of lies and deceit that uh, that Jesus uh, presents us with the truth, and the truth can set us free. So let's read uh, John 10, 1 to 10. Maybe we can stand together, and then I'll pray. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all, uh, out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are the good shepherd. And you have called us to yourself. God, I thank you that you have plant, implanted in our DNA, God, that when we hear the shepherd's voice, we come. God, I thank you that we are your sheep. And I thank you that you have sheep here in Calgary and all across the world who recognize the sound of your voice. God, I pray this morning for Jeremiah as he speaks. God, I pray that the truth that you have given us here, God, that Jeremiah would be able to capture it and help us apply it, God. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit would activate it and transform our hearts. God, that we would hear your voice this morning through Jeremiah's preaching. God, and it would cut like a knife against the lies and mistruths that we have been taught. God, I thank you that the truth cannot compete with a lie, that the truth always wins. God, I pray that we would have receptive hearts this morning to hear your word and to be obedient to wherever you lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, have a seat, everyone. Good morning. 
Good morning. I think we know who the campers are in our church this morning, don't we? Uh, it's good to see you. Happy long weekend. Um, my name is Jeremiah. I'm the lead pastor here at Urban Grace. I'm so glad that you could join us this morning. Um, as you've heard so many times before, Urban Grace is a church that is all about Jesus, and we hope that that is evident in everything that we say and do this morning. If you have any questions about Urban Grace or how you could get plugged in um, to the life of Urban Grace, uh, come and find me. Come and find one of the elders. Go and find John and Lynn at the Connect table in the back. Um, we would love to get you plugged in uh, to the life of our church, and so make sure you do that. Um, if you're watching Watching online, uh, good morning to you there. If you'd like to get more information about Urban Grace, um, just email us hello at urbangracechurch.ca and we will connect with you there. Um, as always, I would recommend that you follow along with a Bible in your hand. If you didn't bring a Bible or you don't own a Bible, um, we want to give you one. So raise your hand. Someone will bring a Bible to you. If you don't own a Bible, hang on to the one that we give you. Um, we think it is so important that everyone have a copy of the Word of God in their hand. And so that is our gift to you uh, this morning. Hang on to the one uh, that we give you if you don't own one. Um, we are in picking up again in the Gospel of John. In, um, what is one of the most famous passages in John's Gospel, and, and arguably one of the most famous passages in all of the Gospels, it's in John chapter 10, um, which is the chapter that the centers around the Good Shepherd. And as Travis read through that passage this morning, uh, I'm sure that, that, like me, you can't help but have your mind flooded um, with images of cute little fluffy sheep and pastures of lush green grass and um, gentle streams of water and smiling shepherds with their staffs uh, leading their sheep over uh, green rolling hills, which makes total sense uh, when we go through this. There is certainly an element uh, of this passage that should take us to images and places like that in our mind. But as we're going to see this morning, as we make our way through John chapter 10, we will see that it is not all um, sunshine and rainbows. In fact, there is a storm that has been brewing um, for quite some time, and there are dark clouds and echoes of thunder and flashes of lightning that are drawing even closer as John is hastily bringing us to the close of Jesus' public ministry and will be leading us to the cross. And the reason for this uh, approaching storm is surrounding Jesus' claims about who he is. They're surrounding his claims about who has sent him and why he has come and about his authority and about what he teaches and, and about what that means for all people, which threatens the power and the authority of the Pharisees who were the religious leaders of that day. Now, um, religious leaders throughout um, the Bible, throughout the Old Testament, we also see this in the New Testament, and what is still true of pastors today, they were called by God to shepherd the flock, to shepherd um, the people of God. They were, they were called to lead God's people back towards Him. They are to um, teach and disciple and admonish and nourish the people of God with God's Word into an abiding relationship with Him. They are to, to lovingly and gently, tenderly care for the spiritual needs of his people. To lead them to life in God. That was the shepherd's role. That is the shepherd's role. And over and over again throughout the word of God, we see that God refers to his people as his sheep. Uh, we can think of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd which means that David and us, we are his sheep. Psalm 100, what we prayed through and went through this morning, it says we are the sheep of his pasture. And so all throughout the Bible, there are so many images and metaphors and parables and allegories of shepherds and sheep relating to God and his people. Now, why sheep? Why does God refer to us as his sheep? Well, um, this might get offensive, but stay with me because we are all in this together. But what are the traits and, and characteristics of sheep? Yes, they are cute and they are cuddly and we probably all like to be thought of like that. But sheep are also weak. Sheep are defenseless. They, they can't hide from their predators. They can't fight for themselves. They can't forage or dig for food. They are timid and they are stubborn and they are frightened by just about anything. And here's where it's going to get offensive. They are not the most intelligent animals. 
In fact, they are pretty stupid. They, they are prone to wander. They, they are known to follow dangerous paths through desolate places, even when green pastures are close by. They're, they're known to get stuck in, in small little holes and get themselves turned over in them, and they're unable to get out by themselves. And there is even accounts of sheep just walking into fire. And, and so if we could do some introspection in our own hearts, and if we could be humble and we could be honest, we could probably now see why God calls us his sheep. We, we too are prone to wander. We are weaker than we think we are. We easily become paralyzed by fear. We are, are timid and we are stubborn and, and we can so easily get our hearts stuck in places that apart from the intervention of God, we will not be able to get ourselves out from on our own. We are like sheep. And so we can see why God places an importance on the role of the shepherd. Now, I have a friend that I used to work with at Mustard Seed who was a, a former pastor and who helped um, with caring for some of the spiritual and, and physical needs of people who accessed services there. And amongst all the, the difficulties and the tragedies that you would regularly witness working in a place like that, he would often say to us, sheep are always finding new ways to die. And so our job is to lead the sheep to where they can find life. And, and friends, th that, is, that is true of all of us in some way. On our own, our hearts will naturally drift towards what will inevitably lead to our death. But like sheep, we are prone to just walk into the fire. And so like sheep, we all need a guide. We need to be led. We need to be shepherded towards life. Now, the problem in this passage and the problem that we've been seeing throughout the Gospel of John is that these so-called shepherds in Jesus' day, they, they weren't living in obedience to the calling that God had placed upon them. Instead of um, leading the people to encounter and obey God, they were leading people away from God and into empty religious ritual. Instead of uh, bringing the people of God to graze in the pastures of God's grace and guarding the flock and leading them into over flowing fountains of his mercy. They, they loaded the people up with the weight of religion and with man-made requirements, and they forced them to, to graze in the barren fields of legalism. They, they were pushing them away to, to turn away from God and turn towards their own efforts, um, leaving God's people distressed and diseased and, and spiritually dead. And, and so the religious leaders of Jesus' time they left the people of God desperately longing for something more, for, for something better. Desperately longing for someone who was able to walk in the calling that God had placed on his shepherds. Someone who would not tie heavy burdens on the shoulders of God's people that even the leaders themselves were unwilling to bear, as Jesus would say about them. But someone who would lead them to the source of, of life and to the life that God offers. They were longing for a shepherd who was good. Last week, Johnny just did a great job taking us through Jesus healing the man who was born blind. If you remember, Jesus had just proclaimed himself as the light of the world and giving the crowd a, a physical display of the spiritual realities that he had just proclaimed. Jesus sees a blind man and he rubs mud on his eyes and miraculously his eyes are opened and this man sees. And we would think that this is where the Pharisees, the shepherds, would have followed this formerly blind man's lead, whose eyes, both physically and spiritually, have now been opened. He has come out of the darkness and seen Jesus as the light of the world. And we would think that in witnessing this incredible miracle, that they, like this man, would fall down at Jesus' feet and worship him. But instead, the, the response of the religious leaders Seeing this miracle was to throw this man out of the synagogue. They publicly excommunicated him out from their gathering, which was the equivalent in that day of being thrown out of every part of life. And so this is the way. This is the example of how God's shepherds were treating God's people. What we saw is that Jesus seeks him out. 
Jesus leads him to life. And and through this miracle, we see this interesting and intentional contrast at the end of chapter 9. That that as this blind man's eyes are opened to the light, the Pharisees, the religious leaders are declared by Jesus to be blind and to be guilty in their sin because of their prideful obstinance and their failure to recognize Jesus. And and now with these same Pharisees from chapter 9 as his listening audience, Jesus immediately um, shifts away from this miraculous healing in chapter 9. And in an allegory about shepherds, we move into chapter 10. And this morning, um, as we move into this text, here is the main idea of the passage for us today. The the main idea for us is only the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, can give his sheep unconditional love and lead his people to the joy of abundant life. So follow him. Let me say that again. Only the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, can give his sheep unconditional love unconditional love, and lead his people to the joy of abundant life. So follow him. And this is important for us today because in our endless search for joy and for happiness and for fulfillment and love and contentment, in our endless search for life, There are so many people and so many things who who will promise us an end to our search if we would only follow them. But just like the Pharisees of that day, the, the false shepherds of our day can never satisfy the longing in our hearts. But friends, the good shepherd feeds his sheep with the love that we are longing for and comes to give us life and life to the fullest. Amen? We've got two points today. The first one, the true shepherd's love for his sheep. Number two, the true shepherd's provision of life for his sheep. And so let's look at chapter 10, verses 1 to 13. If you can, follow along with your Bible. Otherwise, uh, it will be up on the screen. Chapter 10, verses 1 to 3. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. Now, th- this imagery of shepherds and of sheepfolds and, and, and gatekeepers is largely lost on us to a 21st century audience. But the, but the sheepfold and the idea of thieves and robbers coming in to steal the sheep away, th- this would have been a, a common, everyday sight for these people and a concern for these people of this day. But because in every town, in every village, there would be a, a sheepfold or, or a sheep. Pen. There were these enclosures that were made with stone walls. They were about six feet high, and they had one door, only one entrance. And what would happen is, is several different shepherds, each with different flocks, they would bring their sheep into the sheepfolds at night. And so during the day, they would be out in a pasture with their flocks, and at night they'd come into the village to rest, and the shepherds would take their flocks to the sheepfold where a gatekeeper uh, would stand watch through the night so the shepherds could rest. And the only person who could come into the, the sheepfold and get past that gatekeeper was the shepherd of the sheep. But as we're told in this passage, there were bandits. There were thieves and robbers who who wouldn't go through the door, but who would attempt to climb over the walls and steal the sheep away. They they would take what they did not own, what they did not pay for or care for or love, and they would try and take these stolen sheep and sell them off to other shepherds or or sell them off to people for um, meat or or wool. Um, They were using and, and abusing these stolen sheep for their own profit and their own gain. Verse 3, Jesus continues, to him, that is to the the shepherd, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls out, or I'm sorry, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from, for they do not know the voice of strangers. 
And so the shepherds, they would come back each morning. And, and just remember, there are um, several herds of sheep in this one sheep pen. And so this could be hundreds of sheep in the sheepfold, um, several flocks belonging to several different shepherds. And you'd, you'd, you'd think that this getting your sheep together each morning would be this really confusing thing. And so um, maybe the best way to get our sheep is, is like simply say like, hey, let's just make sure that we walk out of here with the same sheep that we walked in with. They're, they're just sheep. They're just livestock. It doesn't really matter that much. But, but that's not how it worked. And it didn't work that way because the shepherds loved their sheep. They, they knew their sheep by name. And the, and the sheep knew their shepherd. They knew his voice. And, and so the shepherds would go into the sheepfold each morning. And amongst these hundreds and hundreds of sheep, he would simply sort of call out their name in this, this sing-song way. Like, here, Cotton. Here, Cotton. Come on. Come on, short ears. I see you, Snowflake. You come over here. And, and the sheep, they would hear their shepherd's voice, and they would separate themselves in, into their flocks and follow their shepherd out of the sheepfold. They, 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 would, and they would know by their shepherd's voice, that's the shepherd who brings me to fields of, of green pastures and still waters. That's the shepherd who protects me. That's the shepherd whose voice I have heard my whole life. That's the shepherd who knows my name. And they follow him. There's actually even accounts of um, people um, who, who were not the shepherd going into a sheepfold dressed up as one of these shepherds. And the sheep wouldn't follow him because his voice was different. And they wouldn't follow the voice of a stranger. Now, Jesus is, is obviously using this allegory to point his, his audience, these, these religious leaders, these Pharisees, to a truth. But verse 6 says that this figure of speech Jesus used with them, they did not understand what he was saying to them. And again, that just further illustrates their blindness and further illustrates Jesus' point here. Because here, Jesus is first making a, a clear distinction between shepherds, which the Pharisees were called to be, and thieves and robbers. And these religious leaders who were called to shepherd God's sheep, to, to love and to care for and to nurture his people, to lead them towards life in God, they had failed. And, and they had not just been careless in their duty as shepherds, but they had used and abused and berated and burdened the flock that they were entrusted with. And Jesus is making a point here. He's saying, clearly, you are not shepherds. And if you are not shepherds, then there's only one other thing that you can be. You are thieves and you are robbers. You don't, you don't go through the door, but you jump the fence and steal and rob from the people that you have been entrusted to care for. And so this is, rather, this is um, so obviously seen in, in the way that this blind man had just been treated by these Pharisees. That rather than, than caring for this man in his blindness, rather than joining him to celebrate his healing and recognizing Jesus as, as the Son of God, the light of the world, the Messiah, that hearing his voice and, and worshiping him, instead of doing that, they, they threw this man out of the synagogue, out from under the protection of the shepherds, out of life, and, and this left the sheep as a meal for the wolves. And we have to see here that, that what Jesus is referring back to is this Old Testament passage. And he's clearly trying to get his audience to remember um, this passage that's found in Ezekiel 34, where, where God condemns and just berates the, the religious leaders, the shepherds of that day. And he says to them, it's up on the screen, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. And, and this indictment of the shepherds 600 years before Jesus Christ is, is just repeating and replaying itself out in Christ's day. And Jesus is saying, this is who you are. You are thieves and robbers. You are fattening yourselves on the backs of sheep that you have been charged to care for. What's interesting is if we continue on in Ezekiel 34, what we see is what God says about himself. He says, for thus says the Lord God, 
Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the straight, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. My friends, Jesus, he comes into this world and he feeds the hungry and he calls them to feast on him who is the bread of life. And he calls the thirsty to himself and he says, drink from me and you will never thirst again. And from your heart will flow rivers of living water. He he seeks out the blind and he opens their eyes to him who is the light of the world. And he calls the lost and the strayed and the poor and the helpless and the burdened and the brokenhearted and the marginalized. He seeks those who have been lost and who have been cast out in fulfillment of this prophecy back in in Ezekiel. He's saying, I am the shepherd. I am the one who is promised, who comes through the gate to gather my sheep. I am the one who calls you by your name and who will lead you out to life. Follow me. And through this allegory, Jesus gives us this incredible picture of his relationship to his sheep. Jesus isn't just like those thieves and robbers who have no care for the sheep and who use the sheep for their personal gain, but Jesus loves the sheep. It's so much so that he knows everything about them. He knows their weaknesses. He knows their burdens. He knows their heartache and their pain. He knows their sin and their failings. And he doesn't take advantage of them for his own gain, but he calls them to himself by name. He says, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. No, no, calling his sheep, as Jesus is saying here, is, is really significant because it's referring to the act of God's gracious call, which produces in us saving faith. In, in theological language or terms, it's often called the effectual calling. The effectual calling is the work of the Spirit of God that brings us to conviction over our sin, revealing us the misery of living apart from God and enlightening our hearts and minds to the knowledge of Christ, which leads us and enables us to embrace Jesus as our Savior through the free offer of the gospel. And if you're asking, what does that mean? Well, it means that salvation, the awakening of your spiritually dead heart brought to life in Jesus is only through the work of God by his grace producing faith in, you, in, in, in us, in each one of us, which means that, that Jesus didn't call your name because you knew more. He didn't call your name because you tried harder or you were morally superior or less sinful than others around you. No, you are not and, and cannot be saved by anything that you do, but only because of God's love and mercy towards you did he call you out from among the sheepfold and to himself. And, and friends, This is the beautiful, loving kindness of our shepherd. Because what this means is that before the foundations of the universe and before you did anything to ever move towards God, he saw into the depths of your sinful and wicked heart every sin that you had ever committed or every sin that you would commit. And in love, he moved towards you. In his loving kindness, Jesus said, I love him. I love her so much that I will give my life in your place so that you might receive the love of God. Romans 5 verse 8 says, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So brothers and sisters, what security we have. That knowing that, that nothing takes Jesus by surprise. That there, there are no curveballs thrown at him. His love is not revoked or removed by our sin, but he has seen to the, the core of who we are, and still he calls us to himself. The, the relationship of the sheep to the shepherd is that you were his before he even called you. You are known and you are loved by him, and he calls your 
name. We see this, this act of calling all over the New Testament. Jesus calls out, Matthew, follow me. Peter, Andrew, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. We're having dinner tonight. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, I, I love in, in John chapter 20, and we'll get to this in like seven more years. Mary is at the empty tomb of Jesus, and she mistakes the risen Christ for a gardener in the garden. She says to this man that she thinks is the gardener, if you have carried him away, tell me where you laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus replied to her, Mary. He, he called her name. She recognized him. In a few weeks, we'll see Jesus stand at the edge of a tomb and say, Lazarus, come out. And what did they all do? Every one of them whose name he calls, they hear his voice and they follow him. In, in calling our names, Jesus awakens the dead heart to life and lovingly beckons us to follow after him. Friends, this morning, do you know that one? D do you know the love of the shepherd who despite your failing and your falters and your wandering, still he calls you to himself? D do you know the, the love of God that will never change, that, that will never love you more on your best day or love you less on your worst day? A love that never stops, a love that never gives up, the always and forever love of God that never wavers but pursues you and saves you and sustains you. The, the love of God that, that moved towards you before you would ever move towards him. The, the love that makes us want to follow him because we know that wherever he leads us, surely goodness and mercy will follow after us. If you don't know this love, if your heart has never heard his voice, you can call to him today and say, Jesus, I want this love. I want my dead heart awakened. Help me. And, and if you call to him in faith, your eyes will be open just like that blind man's. Your dead heart will start to beat like Lazarus. You will hear the voice of your shepherd calling your name, and you will know his love, and you will follow after him. As the Bible says, the Pharisees didn't understand what Jesus was saying, but Jesus doesn't stop to explain it to them. Instead, he gives another allegory. And it's not that, that he's intentionally trying to confuse them, um, but he is certainly proving just how blind they are and how deaf they are in hearing his voice. And so Jesus, he slightly changes the metaphor, which brings us to our second point, the shepherd's provision of life for his sheep. We start in verse 7. Starting in verse 7, it says, So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, and remember, when Jesus says truly, truly, it is our cue to listen up because we are about to get the very truth about the truth from the truth. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. Verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The, sheep come, the, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so Jesus is saying, not only am I the shepherd who passes through the door by the gatekeeper to gather my sheep, but he now says in this allegory, I am the door. Or your Bible might say, I am the gate. And this is one of the seven I am statements that we find uh, Jesus made throughout the Gospel of John. These are statements where Jesus is rightfully taking the covenant personal name of God and proclaiming it over himself. And here he says, I am the door. Now, by taking this name, Jesus is obviously making a very big claim of his divinity. He is very clearly claiming, I am God. But he is also in this making very big claims of exclusivity, inclusivity, 
protection, and provision. And as we go through this point, we're going to take all of those in turn. First, Jesus is making a point of exclusivity. Let's look again at verse 9. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Now, the, the only way for a sheep to enter into the fold is through the door or through the gate. And remember, when, when we think about the structure of the sheepfold, which Jesus has intentionally used here, there is only one door. There, there is no back door. There is no side door. There is no garage door that allows entrance into it. There is one door. And if the door in this allegory is Jesus, and if it says that all those who enter will be saved, then what he is clearly saying is there is no way to be saved except through me. He's saying to these Pharisees, your your religion, your morality, your man-made laws, your good deeds, they cannot save you. But there is but one way to salvation, and it is through the door, which is Jesus Christ. And we, we all know that this just shoots across the bow of our, our pluralistic, post-truth, post-modern society. Where we see and we hear and we believe things like every way leads to God. Or, or I can decide my own path to salvation or happiness or personal fulfillment or enlightenment. Where, where we believe that if, if I'm just a good person which I can determine on my own what that means, then God, which again, I can determine on my own what that means, should, should just accept me based on my good deeds and my morality. Or, or where we think that I, I could just take a little bit of this religion, or I could take a little bit of that religion, or I could follow Buddha on some days, I could follow the Quran on some other days, and sometimes I like Jesus, I like the things that he says about love, but I don't really love what he has to say about hell and sex and loving my enemies, but I can just mix it all together in a way that I like, and God should just welcome me in because I'm a pretty good person. And friends, if that is you, then you are trying to find another door. But there is only one door. There is one gate, and it is Jesus Christ. And if you want to be saved, if you want eternal life, if you want the abundant life that Jesus promises, it is only through him. Any other way is not a means to gain life, but it is a path to forfeiting it. Salvation is exclusively through the door. And so Jesus is radically exclusive. But what we see is that Jesus is also radically inclusive. Let's look again at verse 9. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And so friends, the offer of salvation through the door of Jesus Christ is given to everyone and anyone. The gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ is for all people. And and the door is open to all who would come to him. There is no race, no tribe, no color, no tongue that is excluded from the offer of salvation in Jesus Christ. There is no person too sinful or too broken or too lost or too far gone or too addicted or too depressed or too anxious to be excluded from the offer of the gospel. No, go to him in your brokenness. Go to him in your addiction. Go to him with your anxieties and your worries and in your tears. In fact, that is who Jesus calls to himself. He says in Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will Find rest for your souls. Friends, uh, this morning, are are you weary and heavy laden? Uh, are, Are you beat up and broken down and burdened? Jesus invites you to himself to enter into his fold and experience his rest. But you must come in faith in Him. Believing in Him as your shepherd. And and that means that, that like we said a couple of weeks ago, it means we come to Him empty-handed, setting down everything that we have rested and relied upon for what we thought would bring us life. 
setting down and letting go of everything that we think gets us through the door. And so we set aside our, our pride. We set aside our morality. We set aside our ped- pedigree and performance. And empty-handed, we cling to the cross, that trusting in him that for every place that we have failed, every sin that we have committed, every wrong that we have done, all the debt that our sin has accrued, in faith we believe that Jesus' perfect life and his sacrificial death has paid the price to welcome us in through the door. That we have done nothing to earn or deserve to be saved, to have him call our name or bring us into his fold. And yet by his grace, he offers us forgiveness and he welcomes us in with love. And so Jesus is exclusive. Jesus is inclusive. We also see that Jesus, the door, is also our protector. A man named Sir George Adam Smith, who was the most widely renowned Old Testament scholar of his time. He tells a story about when he visited the Jordan Valley um, in the early 1900s. The Jordan Valley is the border between Jordan and Israel. He said that on his journey, he came across a shepherd and his sheep, and he fell into a conversation with him. The man showed him the fold into which the sheep were led at night. It consisted of four walls with a single way in. Sir George said to him, that is where they go at night? Yes, said the shepherd, and when they are in there, they are perfectly safe. But there, are no, there is no door, said George. I am the door, said the shepherd. He was not a Christian man. He was not speaking in the language of the New Testament. He was speaking from the Arab shepherd's standpoint. And Sir George looked at him and said, what do you mean by the door? Said the shepherd, when the light has gone and all the sheep are inside, I lie in the open space, and no sheep ever goes out but across my body, and no wolf comes in unless he crosses my body. I am the door. Friends, when you come through the door and you enter into the sheepfold of Christ, you have his protection. You belong to him. And there is no one and no thing that could ever pull you away from him. Jesus is your protector, and he will protect you from the thieves and robbers who only come to try to steal, kill, and destroy the hope and the love and the life that Christ has given you. He is your protector against the attacks of the enemy, the accusations and claims of the devil. Satan's power is broken because Jesus has defeated him on the cross. His blood has redeemed you. His blood has purchased you out from the slavery and the chains of your sin. And he is your protector against death. Death was defeated in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he is alive forevermore. And now death has no sting. Death has no victory because it has been swallowed up in the victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is your protector. And lastly, he is our provider. Again, let's look at verses 9 and 10. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. My friends, Jesus not only saves us from something, but Jesus saves us to something. When we go through the door and we dwell in the protection and safety of our merciful Savior, we are also led out under his protection to the provision of his pasture. And that pasture that Jesus is referring to is the abundant life that he alone provides to us. And so when we are are saved by Jesus, he does not save us to an extended existence of the, the mediocre or moderately fulfilling. No, he has come to give us life. And what that means is that every part of your existence before Jesus was not or is not living the, the, the search for meaning and truth and fulfillment, the, the search for joy and for pleasure and for satisfaction, the, the search for purpose and hope and love, the search for life is found only in Jesus. That Jesus has come so that we could have life and have it abundantly. But one commentator 
He, he simply describes the abundant life as life at its scarcely imagined best. The, the life that, that Jesus provides for his sheep will not just be middling, but it is extravagantly, expansively full. It is life overflowing. Life as we had never had or ever could have apart from faith in Jesus Christ. So friends, and that doesn't mean that, that we are just constantly frolicking in the green meadows where life is easy. But Jesus, he never promises us a trouble-free life. But in his abundant life, what he does promise us is an endless joy. A joy that, that rises above every circumstance that we might face, no matter how deep or dark we might get pulled in. That, that even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we walk under the supernatural care of our good shepherd. That, that even when we are surrounded by our enemy, we have a shepherd who in his limitless provision spreads out a banquet table for us. And, and even when we can't see where he is leading us, we have boundless hope, knowing that, that under the care of the shepherd, he is leading us on paths of righteousness for his glory and for our good, that surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. That is the abundant life that Jesus offers for all who would come through the door of Jesus Christ and receive the free gift of his salvation. And so friends, if your life is being guided by, or if you are attempting to find life in anything other than Jesus Christ, then that thing will eventually steal, kill, and destroy you. If, if you pursue anyone or anything as ultimate in your life other than Jesus, it will fail you. If you think that the abundant life is found in your wealth or your career or your family or in your health or in your status or in your freeze, uh, freedom, you are, are grazing in withered pastures and drinking polluted waters. If you are looking for life in anything except Jesus, you will be robbed of the delight that God provides to you in Christ. Only in Jesus can you find unshakable joy and abundant life. And friends, Jesus promises that the closer that we walk with him and the more intimately we follow him, the greater our joy and the fuller that our lives will be. So I ask you today, do you want life? If you want life, it is only found in Jesus. He is the shepherd who knows and loves his sheep. He is the door. And so call to him today for your salvation. Go to him and, and be met with his unending love for you. Rest in him today that you might experience his abundant life, life to the fullest. And follow him as your shepherd and you will be saved and you will be satisfied. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the promise you made that you would send a good shepherd. We thank you, Lord, that that promise is beyond anything we could ever ima ask or imagine. That God, the fulfillment of your word is better than anything we could have ever hoped for. Because in sending your son, Jesus Christ, we were given the true shepherd, the good shepherd, the shepherd who, whose love for us is a never-ending, never-stopping, never-giving-up, always-and-forever love. We are so thankful for that love that is only available to us through Jesus. I pray, Lord, for my friends here who today do, do not know that love, that, Father, they would come to you asking for you to speak to their hearts and call their names. That by your mercy, you would save them. 
that they would hear the voice of their good shepherd.